Good morning, everyone. Happy Sunday. I love to hear the conversational chatter of people who haven't seen each other in a week. Um, I am delighted to be here with you with some caveats because when the lesson topic circulated back in May, I think it was, about confronting Christianity, and they had topics that I would consider to be various worldview topics associated with Christianity, and it was like a kid in a candy store. I've taught all this. This is what I do with teenagers. I love this. And then it's as if God spoke to me and said, fine, why don't you choose something that's going to be difficult? And naive, I said, yeah, Dr. Wines, I will take number nine dot here. Isn't Christianity homophobic? And as soon as I hit the sin button, it was like, no, because then I found out more information about this. There are going to be middle schoolers there. I'm like, uh, there are going to be people I know that this is Ebenezer. Can, can we talk about homophobia in church? God said, don't worry, it's in the gym. <laughs> what do I do? There are people there. Dr. Allison's going to be there. What do, <laughs> what do I do? You, you speak the truth. And the funny thing is about our time today, it's not really teaching. I do like to teach, but this really isn't teaching. This is engaging, isn't it? And it's a topic that it's at the forefront of our culture. And I think God cares about it. And so, you know, we're going to engage it. I did have that kind of burning bush type of argument with myself. Send someone else to address this topic. I don't speak well. They'll judge me. And then I saw that next week's lesson, you know, Dr. Wines is going to talk about doesn't religion cause violence? And I'm thinking, oh, I'm going to be his object lesson, you know. May offend some people this morning. Am I going outside the range? That wasn't recorded? That was the best part. It, It all goes downhill from here. We have to talk about this topic because it's in our culture and it is elevating. And if we take the issues related to uh, LGBTQI, maybe there's another letter added to it this week, I don't know. They have their own month. It's like black history, it just goes on. And so it's been elevated If you've been following the news, and I don't want to get lost in the political, this is moral. But in America, we kind of lost our moral agreement, and so we're drifting around, and that barge is bumping into things and causing damage. But it's in the schools now, where we're talking about um, orientation and sexuality to little kids. Have you spent time with a second grader recently? That's not what they're thinking. They're thinking about dress up and playing dolls, throwing rocks, drinking Kool-Aid and whatever. So we do have this moral war. And so we have to embrace this question about homophobia. And I was not prepared for this. I was looking through the book and I get to chapter nine and this author who is a female, Rebecca McLaughlin, starts out describing her being drawn to other females. I wasn't thinking that was going to happen. You see, when we bring personal experience into something, and she's wrestling with what God is calling her to do, like so many are, it makes it personal. It makes it powerful, and it makes it really hard and really messy. So... I don't mean to brag, but I think this could be done pretty quickly and succinctly, and we'll get on with our things in just a moment, okay? Because we start with, what does the Bible say about sexuality? What does the Bible say about homosexuality? 
And we can pull out about, I don't know, half a dozen verses. But we'll start with this one. This comes from Leviticus. If a man lies with a male as with a woman, both of them have committed an abomination. Abominations are bad. They shall surely be put to death. Their blood is upon them. Ooh, put that on the naughty list. Let's not do this. Okay. And then if we look into other passages, that's repeated in Leviticus 20. We have the story of Sodom and Gomorrah. That doesn't go well when your entire city is wiped out. We have Romans 1, which makes the case that therefore God gave them up in the lust of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie, dot, dot, dot. And God gave them up to dishonorable passions, etc. Well, that's kind of clear. But then you have 1 Corinthians 6, which is interesting because it starts out with lawsuits against believers. Very fascinating because what are we doing in the courts? We're fighting morality battles, right? We express uh, this desire for nine people in long black robes, like a Harry Potter convention, to sort out our morality for us. And it goes back and forth because there are men and women in those black robes. Let me give you one example. Slavery was legal, and then it became illegal. We could change that. I'm not advocating for that, obviously, but if we had another amendment, it would go back and forth. No, that can't be, Mr. Lemon. How in the world could that be? Do you remember prohibition? Alcohol was legal, and then it was illegal, and then that didn't work, and so we made it legal again. Any time that man tries to decide things for himself without following Almighty God, we do it to ourselves, don't we? So it starts out lawsuits against believers, but of course we go down to um, uh, do not be deceived, don't be tricked, be on your guard. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. So they're in the naughty list. Please note, it is a list. Because sometimes we like to take sins and make them into pinatas and beat the fool out of them if it doesn't affect us. Another example. Let's say that I'm walking along looking amazingly like Tom Sawyer, and there on the windowsill cooling with a warm, buttery pie crust is a steaming offering of Brussels sprouts. I don't mean to out-Christian you guys, but I'll walk right on by. I don't care how you make Brussels sprouts, I really don't want to eat them. I don't have that temptation. So I look down, you Brussels sprout eater. How dare you give in to that sin? Because I'm not tempted. Which is amazing because this author talks about her temptation. And so I point it out because 1 Corinthians 6, it's a list. There's all kinds of lists. And it keeps showing up because homosexuality is bad but so are other sins. We'll get to that in just a minute when we talk about Jesus. We're supposed to flee sexual immorality, and we're told that all things are lawful, but not all things are good. All in the same passage. Okay. So, logically speaking, the Bible says that alternate lifestyles, which is a euphemism for not following God's way in sexuality... I just got to point out, you see how quiet it is in here? I've used the word sexuality at least five times. Everybody like, gets quiet. It's God design, middle schoolers, it's okay. Not now. That this is a powerful form of getting our attention. And what we condemn and what we don't condemn, we're to flee all 
sin, ladies and gentlemen. Okay, logically speaking, that was my point. My train left the station. I now see it at the Amtrak yard. Here we go. The Bible condemns homosexuality. As professing believers, we believe the Bible. Therefore, we believe that homosexuality is a sin. I thank you for your time. There's coffee back here. <laughs> time for fellowship, and I think we have plenty of bulletins left. Any questions? There's more to it, isn't there? There's a lot more to it. And we can only hit a few of the points today. But if you would like the eight-hour conversation, I can have it. But I think it boils down to these things. The law. We know the law. Why aren't you living it? <laughs> Same reason I'm not, perhaps. We know the law. We know the God that gives the law. We believe that God is good. Why aren't we doing it? I'm sorry. We're humans. All are sinners who fall short of the glory of God. Amen. So then what else? We'll talk about leeway. And then we'll talk about legality. And then we'll talk about love, which is the real message here. And it's going to get a little messy, but it's going to stay familiar, if that's okay with you. What in the world am I talking about with leeway? Leeway is, well, I know it's wrong, but... And then we start bringing in four-letter words, just and only. Like, that's going to help anybody, right? I just robbed the bank a little. I only took a million. There was more in there, right? Bill Clinton was famous with this. I didn't inhale. You know, we try to chisel it down. And so that's what's happening, and that's what's been happening in our culture. We make excuses, and those that really want something can find a way to justify it. Has anyone met a teenager or one that has grown up? It's sad, but I've been involved in the teaching of formal logic with students, and they turn that weapon back on their parents, back on their teachers, back on everyone. But we can justify, can't we? Notice justify and justice go together. You ever see two lawyers in a court, in a courtroom, going back and forth using their same weapons, the same evidence to try to persuade people one way or the other? So... Let's talk about leeway. Did God really say? Does that sound familiar? Who said that? Tom Cruise. No, 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 no. Yeah, did God really say? When we start doubting God's word, we'll get to his original design in a moment. When we start doubting We've left the highway and our Buick is plowing through cactuses and hitting rocks and, and getting off the, the right path. And that's what's happening. People who really want something are going to pursue it and to justify. And we're going to wind up talking about love, but love is tossed up as a reason that we should be embracing alternative lifestyles. I love a lot of things. Some of them shouldn't be celebrated. <laughs> Leeway. In American culture, we believe we should be happy. Don't we? This is what makes me happy. A God of love would want me to be happy. A loving God should not want me to be unhappy. Therefore, I'm going to do what is making me happy, and God will rubber stamp that. We have a problem with that, but that's where we are in American culture. And if we're really honest, it didn't start with America. It goes back to Cain and Abel. Cain wasn't happy about something, and Abel took the brunt of that, didn't he? So, we have the minor prophets. If you read the minor prophets, uh, it's pretty tough rowing for them. They get thrown in pits, they get beaten up, they get killed. Um, being a prophet is not a favorable position. 
And if you look in the Old Testament, we're told that they wanted prof- the people wanted prophets that would preach wine and beer. That's one of my favorite verses. We want prophets to preach to us peace. We're going to have peace, even though God sent the minor prophets and said, this is not true. Do not believe false prophets. So what do we have in America with happiness? If we go back a little bit to our roots, we go back to the, um, the 1600s. Matthew Henry does something really interesting to connect happiness. He said, those only are happy, truly happy, that are holy. Did you expect that? Truly holy. He's writing on Psalm 1, and he says, goodness and holiness are not only the way to happiness, but happiness itself. Now, in American Tom Sawyer culture, what we expect is that you go over here and you kind of get into mischief, it makes you happy. Then you go back, oh, it's Sunday, right? I got I to gotta be holy. Matthew Henry doesn't give us that option. I have a lousy habit of walking in front of the speakers. Leeway, we twist scripture, don't we? It's a distortion, it's a distraction. We talk about, well, you know... Um, King David had this relationship with Jonathan, and they were very close. They loved each other. They professed their love for each other, that bond, that friendship. You know, they even kissed one time, and we take Scripture and distort it because, you know, if David and Jonathan kissed, what that means, it means they were Middle Eastern men because that's what they did in that culture, and there are many examples of that. When I was a young boy, my grandfather used to kiss me all the time. I promise you, he was not homosexual. He was affectionate. So we take scripture and we distort it, if we're not careful in our culture, to try to make something that is is not real into something that seems real. And and in order to do that, we have to change God and we have to change uh, Jesus a little bit. The second thing we do with leeway is we lean into what I'm going to call sympathy. If you're not familiar with classical Greek and Roman speech, if you will, communication of any kind, it was mostly verbal, you have three elements. One is logos, which is word. It's the facts. It's the meaning. It's what makes sense. So in John 1, Jesus is called the word. He's called the logos in the Greek. And so when you, ex- when you examine the facts of a matter in a court case, that's what you're supposed to do. You know, we found Mr. Mick standing over the body with a machete um, saying, I, I, I killed him, I killed him, I killed him, I killed him. Those are the facts, right? Well, then what else do we have? We have the ethos, which is the credibility And this is where science wants to come in. This is where academia wants to come in and say, well, in the original language, or according to surveys, or we found the homosexual gene in the DNA, which is not true, it's been debunked, but it's still hanging out. That's the ethos. But then we get to what the classical orators would call the weakest argument. And the weakest argument is pathos. We get our word pathetic from that. If you say that's a pathetic argument, what you're saying is there's no facts to it. There's no credibility to it. It's just emotion. That's what pathos is. Isn't it interesting in a courtroom, you get someone coming up to make their concluding remarks, and ladies and gentlemen of the jury, just look at my client. He's only 17. He's a good kid. Ask his mother, you know. The facts of the matter, as opposed to the emotion. So starting in the 1970s, television and movies really started taking a sympathetic line on the people who identified with alternative lifestyles. I remember uh, Barney Miller did that, MASH did that, uh, Tom Hanks. Tom Hanks has had more movies than I have hair, 
And he made a very good one that was very compelling called Philadelphia, I think. Has anybody seen it? Okay. Sympathy, the movie about um, uh, the Queen singer, very sympathy-led. And it causes us to think, well, Jesus wouldn't want anyone to be punished for their sin. After all, they're good people. They're, they're my neighbor. They, they recycle. <laughs> they cut my grass when I'm out of town, right? And it's not that they're pathetic people. Please don't take it that way. I'm just saying that the argument is putting the facts of the matter and the credibility of the matter backwards, and we're focusing on sympathy, we're focusing on emotion. I think that it was, um, oh gosh, I can see him now. Who was George Bush's vice president? I'm sorry, other one. Dick Cheney, okay. I may be totally off base, you can fact chase, check this later, but I believe that he spoke against homosexuality until his daughter entered that lifestyle, and then it gets real, right? Because you're looking across the Thanksgiving table with people that you love, and it gets uh, kind of messy. But anyway, that is the, the leeway. We keep looking for avenues of tearing it down a little bit. And then legality comes after that. I already referenced the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court took our nation from not having homosexual marriage to be legal to finding a civil right to making it legal. It was not legislative, it was not executive. They interpreted that very similar to 1973 where they interpreted uh, a civil right for abortions to be legal. Again, I'm not beating up on the Supreme Court, I'm just saying it was this way and now it's this way. Did God change his mind? Is God okay with sin now? He hates sin. I, he, he really hates sin. And so before we move into Jesus, because Jesus is going to represent love, of course, we have to ask ourselves, is Jesus soft on sin? Nobody understood Jesus, in my opinion, excuse me, Nobody understood sin the way that Jesus did because he bore it all. The stuff that I wink at, the stuff that you allow, the stuff that we as a culture have brought in and said this is good, God says don't call what is not good good and vice versa. He hates it. And so the culture can assume, well, God doesn't care anymore. God is patient. He doesn't want anyone to perish. That's what we're told. And he's allowing this to continue and go on. But it's not because he doesn't care. All right, love. Logically speaking, God is love, Jesus is God, therefore... Going to be on the quiz. <laughs> Logically speaking, Jesus is love. And we know this. And it's natural to ask the question what would Jesus do? The Bible is a little silent on Jesus having conversations with homosexuals. However, he had conversations with lots of people, and for that, he was condemned by the religious leaders of his day. He was a friend of. <laughs> Come on. Sinners! All are sinners and fall short of the glory of God. But the Pharisees had it where maybe if we follow enough rules and we justify our rules, then it'll be okay. And Jesus, he's sitting with tax collectors. He's talking to women. Ooh. Look at his disciples. I love it when people talk about diversity and inclusion. I don't know if any of you have seen the Chosen uh, TV series. It's not gospel, it's not the Bible, but it has opened my eyes to how different his disciples must have been. Oh my goodness. I don't know how they stayed together. Well, it was Jesus, that's how they stayed together. It's as if he picked people to put in his minivan that would drive each other crazy. And they did. They did indeed. So what would Jesus do? Well, he talked to enough people, and you can probably see where I'm driving with this, 
that we can look and see how he would um, relate to them. So the first thing was the divorce trap. So we're told, some Pharisees came to him to test him. Notice the bad motive. Notice the provocative, uh, well, you can't because it's inside the book. The provocative question, isn't Christianity homophobic? We're kind of starting on negative terms right there. So it comes here where the Pharisees want to test him. Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any and every reason? Some of you might think, I had nine reasons this morning just driving over here. I'm talking about the wives and their husbands. Can the wives divorce their husbands for any and every reason? Jesus says, haven't you read, don't you know God's word? He's not talking about Time Magazine here. That at the beginning, at the start of things, the original design, these are my words inserted, the creator, the one who created everything, made them male and female. And said, for this reason, a man will leave his his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. And we know this. We know it. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. We know this. We just don't typically look at it this way when we talk about alternative lifestyles and homosexuals and lesbians and all the other um, scrabble letters that would fall in there. It says, wife, isn't it interesting We have roles being described here by the creator in original design. And when people of the same gender get married or have their partnership, whatever they want to call it, typically one kind of looks like a male and one kind of acts like a female. Even in dressing, mannerisms, hair, and and whatever, we can say that's just cultural. I just raised the topic. And then he talks about how, you know, Moses gave that provision because of how hard-hearted the men were in that one. But the one that we're really driving to, you can probably see it coming, is the woman caught in the act of adultery. What do we have here? We have a marginalized person who is misusing sexuality. It kind of harkens back to the woman that Jesus meets at the well because she was also living in adultery. Except when he talked to the woman at the well, he talked to her in the intimacy of a two-person dialogue. This one where um, they drag this woman in front of God and everyone, it's a public display also meant to, uh, to trap him. And so here's where I would like to spend a little bit of time because Jesus as love and Jesus as law combined to give us some degree. We could take her out, we could move a homosexual in, and we could kind of get a look at what he might have done. When you get into Bible speculation, it's dangerous ground. I ask you to go back to God's word. I'm just raising the topic. Early in the morning, he came again to the temple. He was going to the temple a lot to teach. All the people came to him, and he sat down, and he taught them. The scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in adultery. And you all know, you've all heard, wait a minute, takes two to tango, where's the guy? All right, drop it. We're just looking at this one lady here. Teacher, they said respectfully, this woman has been caught in the act of adultery. Now, in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. That's pretty harsh, isn't it? Let me see if I have anything for my middle school friends. Well, can't find the actual verse, but guess what, middle school friends, would happen if a son was rebellious. The parents would try to correct that. If that didn't work, they would drag him to the elders and to cut to the chase, the entire town would would stone that person. There's a lot of stoning going on in the ancient culture. They tried to stone Jesus too. We don't stone people these days much, but it just shows the severity of it. 
Teacher, this woman has been caught in the act of adultery. If you've ever been an independent Baptist, let me translate for you. The very act. Wow. Now, in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. What do you say? What would Jesus do? This they said to test him that they might have some charge to bring against him. Jesus bent down and wrote with his finger on the ground, like all the rabbis did. All the rabbis, when provoked with an inter- interesting question, they would get down on their knees and write in the ground. Haven't you seen that? I don't think that was normal. Boy, did it shut them up. What's this guy doing? I told you he was weird. He bends down, and the question everybody wants to know is, what was he writing? There's tremendous speculation about that, and some of them are probably accurate. But he's writing because they want a pat answer. Just like many of us want a pat answer on LGBTQI whatever. But those letters represent people, and Jesus loves people. Hate sin, loves people. More on that in just a minute. And as they continued to ask him, I find that fascinating. Uh, hey, scribbler guy, we asked you a question. You're going to give us an answer? You ever seen reporters around the president trying to ask tough questions? That's what they're doing here. They're pushing it. We want an answer. We want an answer. As they continued to ask him, he stood up and said to them, Don't you wish the Bible had tone of voice? How did he say it? Did he scream? Did he whisper? Let him who is without sin among you be the first to throw a stone at her. He doesn't answer the question. He talks qualification. So, I was tempted to hand out these paddles and dry erase markers on your seat and say, would you, if you'll take a moment, write down all of your sins, uh, just, just the biggies, okay? Over, overdue parking, they're not going to count today. You know, would you do that? Some of you are trying to read my sins. Um, they would be continued on the back. That's not what they're looking for. And so why am I bringing it up? Because if we go further with Jesus, Jesus says that you're supposed to take the speck out, the log, excuse me, out of your eye before you try to correct somebody's speck in their eye. I think that that speaks here. I think this is what Rebecca, gosh, I'm calling her by her first name, like we're friends. McLaughlin was kind of getting at is that we're so quick to judge and we have a pinata sin here. This is bad. This is really bad. We got to stone her. What about your sins? Ah, maybe you can throw a pebble, okay? But this is bad. And sometimes in the church, we look back to my Brussels sprouts example and say, well, at least I've never done that. And talking about adultery, many of the Pharisees and scribes could get on the, on the stand and put their hand on the Bible or the Torah, the scroll or whatever, and say, I have never committed adultery in my life. Therefore, I'm qualified to kill her or him. But Jesus took that away, didn't he? You've heard it said. Do not commit adultery. Yes, sir, I checked that one off. But I say to you, it's a, it's a thought if you've ever had those, those thoughts. You think some of these people heard that teaching talked about? So he lands that one on them. If you got no sin, you go first. All it takes is some wiseacre who thinks he hasn't sinned, like the rich young ruler, to throw a rock, and it would have been, you know, crazy. But nobody does. And once more he bent down, ignoring them, and wrote on the ground. But when they heard it, they went away, one by one, beginning with the older ones who got it. 
And the problem is, if they said they had no sin, that perhaps the Pharisee next to them would be going, oh, remember? In Capernaum? Huh? You told that dirty joke? I don't know. I'm speculating here. But they all left. And then it's interesting. Because Jesus is left alone with a woman standing before him. And I will now switch to King James because I think it's cool. Jesus said unto her, Woman, where are those thine accusers? Hath no man condemned thee? And she's... She, can you imagine this, this lady, this human being? She thinks she's going to die. You got this strange guy riding on the ground. Everybody leaves. That's not exactly how she thought that was going to play out. And she says, No one, Lord. And Jesus said, Well, I will. I'm sorry, that's from the message. Um, No one, Lord, and Jesus does not say, well, I will. He could have. He qualified. He could have gotten the sons of thunder, a couple of big rocks, could have taken care of business. He doesn't. He says, neither do I condemn you. Go. Oh, there's more, isn't there? There's more to that verse. And from now on, sin no more. Now, I don't think he's saying don't ever sin. But in this, this area, this, this, this is not helpful. I made you. Colossians 1 says Jesus made her. You've you got to break free of this sin. But this is where it's messy. This is where Mrs. McLaughlin uh, is trying to bring humanity into the discussion. And what I mean by that is it's relationships. She had had relationships with people. I'll give you a crazy example from the Old Testament. And I don't remember it squarely, so please forgive me. But you had a man of God tell the Israelites, you have married foreign women. God is not pleased. You need to leave them. All right, let me go back through that one more time in case you missed it. Your wife and kids, you, you got to separate. That's what they're being faced with. To go out of a sinful lifestyle of any type is hard. And that has to be factored in. It's very simple. Um, Linda, stop sinning. Maybe you've seen that, that, that viral video that Bob Newhart did where um, this lady has a problem and you know, she's going to pay him money as a psychiatrist to solve her problem and they get down to brass tacks and he just looks at her and goes, stop it! <laughs> it's funny because <laughs> it's too easy, right? So Jesus is loving her. It doesn't say he looked at her with love, but if we extrapolate, that's what he said to the rich young ruler, Right? You got this Boy Scout Pharisee. He goes, I've kept them all. Sorry, Boy Scout is three. And Jesus looked at him with love. Jesus looked at him and loved him. You don't have a clue. I tell you what, sell everything, follow me. We start to see how Jesus is dealing with people. It's hard. It's so hard. The rich young ruler went away sad. Couldn't walk away from that lifestyle. And I'm not trying to play with words. I'm just saying sin is hard but he tells her in love I don't I don't condemn you at the same time your sins killing you literally you got to stop it and so you have the holy creator giving um, giving her the truth so any questions so far wow what do we do this is easy. Just do what Jesus would do. Isn't that simple and yet excruciatingly impossible? First of all, we've yet to answer the question, so this is a really bad habit. I'll try to stop. As we wind up, we need to look at the question. Isn't Christianity homophobic? Well, Christianity, I think we're talking about Orthodox Christianity, we're following the teachings of Jesus, 
we're talking about the Bible being the inerrant word of God. That's, that's my uh, platform here. And then we have homophobic. Homo, coming from, you know, homogenous, perhaps, the same. Um, I like to have my milk homogenous, apparently. Um, we have homo sapiens because they're all humans. Um, God loves diversity, but he wants them homogenous in being in submission to him. But in this case, that's not what we're talking about. We're not talking about milk. We're not talking about how Scandinavians get along so well because they're all Scandinavians. If you go to Scandinavia, guess what? Norway, Sweden, they kind of all look alike. They're beautiful, they're blonde, and they're living in a place that's way too cold. Okay? But the book is not talking about that. Um, it's talking about homosexuality, it's talking about relationships that are inappropriate, biblically speaking, between men or women or, or whatever, mailboxes, I don't know, outside of God's plan. And then we have phobia, and you know phobia is fear. Some people are scared of black cats, some people are scared of elevators, uh, some people have closet phobia because they don't like small spaces. That was a joke, okay. So are we scared? Are we scared of alternate lifestyles? Are we scared of people who celebrate uh, gay pride uh, parades? Are we scared of people who um, are cross-dressers or transgender or whatever? Are we scared of people who are male but then identify as women and then get a boxing match and win? That happened recently in the Olympics. Are we scared? Well, there's a couple of reasons we probably are, if we're honest, and you can add your own. First of all, I was born in the South. I don't like confrontation. In the South, we don't talk in a confronting way to you. We talk behind your back. And we talk behind your back just loudly enough that you might get the gist of it and change from your sinful ways. I was brought up with, well, bless his heart. Bless his heart. Bless. He just doesn't understand. And we don't confront, we don't confront, we don't confront until you make us mad enough that we fire on your Fort Sumter and we start a civil war. Okay, don't provoke us. Southerners are generally like that, and that was me. That still is me. I've just learned to be a little bit more confrontational. Jesus calls us to be confrontational, and it's uncomfortable. If I like you or I don't like you, I'm scared to have a conversation with you. And I'm going to share one nugget at the end here that you might be able to use. It has helped me. The second thing is we are or we should be scared for their salvation. I don't think we take that seriously enough. You know, well, I'm across the line, I'm saved. You people need to get right with God, but I'm on first base. I'm good. Another way we should be scared is, remember Sodom and Gomorrah? Go looking for them today. And Jesus took it, as he so often does, he took it a little bit further, didn't he? And he said, woe to you, Bethsaida. Woe to you, Capernaum. Because when I preached there, Sodom and Gomorrah, Tyre and Sidon, would believe if I went there and preached the truth. If you remember Jonah, he went and he preached to Nineveh and they changed and it made him upset. But we should be really concerned that our nation will be wiped out. That's another reason that we should be scared. But we shouldn't be scared of the people because they are people no matter how much they're confronting or yelling or crying, or whatever. So I leave you with this one nugget, because you have people who feel judged, and they want desperately to be affirmed. This is why making it okay to live with a partner is not enough. They want marriage. They want a certificate. They want to be accepted. They want laws. They want to think that what they're doing is right. They're looking for that affirmation. Not that I watched Cheers back in the day, but remember the song? They desperately want a place where everybody knows their name. That's why it's called, I believe, the LGBTI, etc., community. 
They desperately want community. And they look at people in the church and they say, we want that, except can we leave God out of it? Do you know the atheists have a church now? They, they get together and they sing patriotic songs and poetry and stuff. And they have hot dish and coffee, you know, but they just want to leave God out of it. Okay, so back to the nugget. This is what I share with people when I'm put in that situation. Do you think what I'm doing is sinful? The Bible says it's sinful. Yeah, though, well, therefore, you think it's sinful. Well, I have to believe what God's word has said because I've staked my life and my faith on that. Well, you're hateful. Here's the nugget. I don't believe it's God's best for you. If I can be candid, I don't believe it's God's best because that's what he says. He loves you more than anything else, and he wants the best for you. And logically speaking, if you're choosing something that God says is not his best, then it's not the best for you, and it makes me sad. Or you can take it any direction that you want to, but they want to pummel you, they want to pummel me for God's truth, and God has created and put breath in our bodies to be there to share the truth in. Why are we whispering? Love! Yeah! Isn't it true? The truth, the truth part's easy, the love part's hard. But that's, that's one nugget I would share with you as, as we end. That, um, that if you push that button, God's best, God loves you, God's best, that it may open different doors because, in my experience, they're not used to hearing that. And I'm not talking about them as a mob. I'm talking about that beautiful human being right in, in front of you. All right, that appears to be all of our time. I'd like to pray over us, and then we'll be dismissed. Uh, Father God, you are the creator. And throughout your word, you have truth and you have love. And I ask that you would embolden us, give us courage, give us resources, be ready to stand at any opportunity to give an account, but help us to do it in love. Help us to focus on Jesus and how much he loved us and forgave our sins. I pray peace upon this congregation in Jesus' name. Amen.